Hello and welcome again to Exploring Mental Illness, Everything You Wanted to Know But Were Afraid to Ask. We're glad that you're back with us today. I am Derek Mulhan. Carrie Ballou is currently on assignment at the hospital today, so she couldn't join us. But we're going to get right into it because I have two special guests here in studio who uh, are going to talk about some very important uh, topics that we haven't actually discussed in the past. So if you ladies could introduce yourself to the folks at home. Sure. Hi, everybody. I'm Jackie O'Brien, and I am the Attleboro Public Health Nurse, and I am also the coordinator for the Greater Attleboro Area Suicide Prevention Coalition. I'm Anne Marie Matulis. I'm the director for the Bristol County Regional Coalition for Suicide Prevention. If you ladies could tell us, how did, how did you get into this work? Um, I had about 35 years in public health. The beginning of it was in domestic violence and substance abuse. And about 10 years ago, the Department of Public Health Suicide Prevention Division asked if I would sort of step to the side a bit and take on suicide because we had extremely high rates of suicide attempts for youth in Bristol County at that time. It was not my forte. I didn't really know much about it. So I, I did the little catch up as fast as you can, and that was 10 years ago. We started with a, a coalition, a task force in Taunton, the greater Taunton area, and then um, one developed in New Bedford because they had had a, a very tragic series of five adolescents who had died by suicide within a very quick period of time. And in the end of 2011, the state said, well, we don't have any regional coalitions um, in southeastern Massachusetts. Would you be willing to take that on? formed very nicely. It was the entire county, Bristol County, and we have one in Plymouth. So in the state, we have 10 regional coalitions across the state. So our work is to carry a message of hope, to help people find resources, to do everything we can to prevent suicide. It's education, training, community conversations. And then two and a half years ago, I reached out to the greater Attleboro area, and Jackie happened to be at the meeting at the time. And I talked about the stats that we have in Bristol County and how high they are statewide, went down and did the same thing in Fall River, and two and a half years ago, we now have four community-based coalitions across the county, one in Attleboro, one in Taunton, one in Fall River, and one in New Bedford, and that's how we got Jackie involved. Yeah, so Anne, as Anne Marie said, you know, we attend a lo um, some of the same meetings, and two years in a row, one of the meetings that um, Anne Marie and I attend, she had come to us with the numbers as they were growing in Bristol County for death by suicide. In the first year, you know, I was really amazed and alarmed at the number, but at the time um, didn't have really much time to be able to do much about it. But then when she came back to us the next year, numbers had increased even more in uh, 2015. You know, I sat at the meeting, and she was really imploring people to become involved. And so after I left the meeting, I was thinking about it and thinking, God, this is a really important public health issue, and you are a public health nurse. Why can't you do something about it? So I emailed Anne Marie <laughs> later on, you know, later on that day, and, you know, she and I started conversations. And so we began planning some outreach sessions um, in the greater Attleboro area to get people on board from different agencies and from the community. And then we had our first community conversation of April of 2016, and we had an amazing turnout to that. Um, we had about 50 people that came to that first session. So since then, you know, we had had some general membership meetings, but since then we've probably had seven community conversations in the last two and a half years. We've offered several trainings to raise awareness so people can spot the signs and symptoms people who might be having um, a problem with suicidal thoughts or have had suicide crises, to be able to know how to refer them off. We've actually, one of, I think, our biggest accomplishments, we've had several people step forward to start grief support groups for suicide loss survivors that started this past January. Um, Lisa Jo Mitchell and John Brodeur um, actually have started those. So we have them twice a month. One, the um, second Wednesday of the month, there's actually one this evening at Murray Unitarian Universalist Church that runs from 6.30 to 8 o'clock. And then we also um, have one the fourth Monday of the month at the Attleboro Public Library in the Judge Lee Room. That's also 6.30 to 8 o'clock. And again, that's for anybody who's lost someone to death by suicide anywhere along the spectrum, whether it was recent or whether it was years ago. Do you have the numbers where Massachusetts ranks as far as suicide percentage goes? Mm -hmm. And these numbers come from the CDC. 
a Center for Disease Control. They come out every year. Massachusetts has managed to, I mean, it's a list I hope we can get off of. Right now we're ranked at 47th out of 50 states. But it's hard to translate that to a family who just lost someone. 47th being where Massachusetts is 47th in suicides? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yep. We have the highest per capita spent by the state for suicide prevention, but it's a mere $4.1 million. Many states across the country don't even have a state suicide prevention coalition, let alone community-based coalitions going. It's really been behind the curve in public health. A lot of attention is given to domestic violence, to opiate addiction, and suicide still, we now rank second in cause of death for 15 to 25-year-olds. And yet there is not a whole lot of support for it. So our statewide numbers, thank God, are relatively low when you look at it. But that's hard to explain to a family who has lost someone to suicide. In Bristol County, we've only been tracking our numbers with a database at the courtesy of, thank God, the district attorney's office gives us these numbers in real time. So I know within 24 to 48 hours when there's been a suicide, I don't have to wait two years to find out about it. But our numbers have grown exponentially. They were in the 50s of deaths by suicide in 2010. Um, we are right now at 39, and it's July 11th. We've had 39 suicides to date since January. That's extremely high for our state. Um, we rank number one right now in the state for the number of deaths by suicide. Middle Sex County is right behind us. We um, had, I'll work backwards, we had 61 deaths last year, 2017. We had uh, 61 the year before. In 2016 and in 2015, we had 72, but there's a codicil to that. We won't know the actual 2016 numbers until September. Those final numbers come in because they might have been unattended deaths. There may have been a criminal investigation as a result of the unattended death. There may have been some other reason why the medical examiner left those in the we're not sure category. Our numbers have typically increased exponentially a good 10 to 12 percent every two years. So that number that we have for 2016 right now could increase by another 10 to 12 percent when we get those numbers in September. What's going on? I mean, it's hard to say why it happens, obviously. Well, the CDC just released a report uh, a month ago now. Yeah, about that. And it's off of a 10-year study that sort of came as a surprise to many people and not so much to the rest of us that more than 50% of the people who died by suicide between 1999 and 2016 had no diagnosed mental health illness. There was no predominant factor in there that was to say it was because of depression or bipolar or borderline personality or schizophrenia. Now, there are some in the field who will say, well, it could have been undiagnosed. And that's true, except I firmly believe that there are other factors involved here. It could be the opiate addiction. It could be, we know that 20% of battered women, women who experience domestic violence, become suicidal after they're freed from that domestic violence. I was a battered woman, and I didn't know that. When I saw that stat, I went, wow, who knew that? So it could be the post-traumatic stress. It could be, we know, financial crisis has hammered Bristol County, and we see that a lot in the notes that come from the medical examiner. One of the most important things that people need to know is it is not one thing. It's like the perfect storm. You know, this happens, then that happens, then this happens. That may not be so life-threatening to us, but it just may be the final straw on another person. Uh, We know we have a middle-age crisis. Our highest numbers of all those numbers I gave you 75 to 80 percent of those numbers for Bristol County and across the country are white men aged 44 to 64. We have those numbers, but we are not talking about the people that are impacted, whether it's just somebody going through a suicidal crisis or losing to somebody to death by suicide. It's what, about five people for, or is it more than that, Anne Marie? 137 for everyone who dies. So that's a lot of impacted people when you look at the big picture, and that's what really I think we have to make people aware about. Um, You know, you have your close circle, but it could be somebody who babysat the individual. It could be teachers, 
students, friends, the bank teller. Ba yeah. So again, it's hard to know when that will you know when that will impact people. So when you look at that number, and then by the number of suicides that we had, I mean the numbers in 2016 were ballpark 45,000. You multiply that by 137, you're looking at a boatload Millions. of people. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm a suicide attempt survivor. And I had had lost all hope, and I decided, you know what, I'm going to take a bunch of pills. And I started taking my pills, and I had a panic attack. And on my panic attack was, I'm afraid I'm going to die. And I was just like, you idiot, you're taking pills, of course you're going to die. And I started laughing, and I put the pills back, and I called my therapist and said, this is what happened, and it's never happened again. Mm -hmm. My question is for you, I don't know if this is answerable or not, that was a, a split decision that I made right there. Do most people plan a suicide, or is it a, a decision right on the spot? The majority of the, those who die by suicide, it took some time to plan. Really? Now, that could be a week. It could be 10 years. But we do have an impulsive spontaneity that happens. That typically happens with young kids and the elderly more than the in-between. The other issue is, is that as a suicide attempt survivor, that you have not been disturbed by that thought process again is unusual. Most suicide attempt survivors who, who do live, turn their life around, on the outside look just fine, will be plagued by ongoing, a mutual friend of ours, Tracy describes it as, it's just kind of like the wind blowing by the suicidal thought will be there again, but it never turns into a plan. It never turns turns into action. It never turns into any other form, but it is there, and it can keep coming over the years. So that can be disturbing to families. But what Jackie's also talking about is, you know, the, the numbers, Derek, are just so huge. So you take 45,000 and you multiply it by the 137, which is the minimal. That research is by Dr. Julie Serrell from the University of Kentucky. It's already been published. It's already been verified. She went through the whole vetting process on it. Then you also have tip of the iceberg. They say, well, there are 25 more like you for every death that, who attempted. We know that's outrageous. It's probably closer to two to 300. The point is that even if we take that 25, that's 1.1 million, 7% will attempt again and die. That leaves 93%, just like you, who made an attempt and lived. They're the people we need at the table. We need to know how people turn their lives around. Everything, when, when we do this, I mean, everything is out on the table. In fact, Jackie, I, one of the things I told you, I yeah. mean, we were yep. talking, we were, we were, we were filming. I remember when we did the Public Library. Right, yeah. we were filming, and um, I had said that I was, uh, you know, in... The way that I laughed it off, it was just so ludicrous and so out, you know, outrageous. And I just realized, you know, I have, I have more to live for. I have so much more to live for. And the fact that it was ironic that I was, I was afraid to die, even though. But like I said, that was a, a split decision. My next question is, there's always been a very fine line on this question. And I don't know if either one of you are going to be able to answer it. I don't think there's any right answer. But some people believe that if the only way out is to commit suicide, you can't be mad at that person because the only way that they could cure themselves was by committing suicide. And then other people say, well, you commit suicide, you're leaving everybody else behind, and that's selfish. I don't think it's selfish. I think some people, they just, the only way that they can get themselves to be happy is to go and do what they feel they need to do. It's a, it's a tough question. There's a lot of people who are just like, you know, that's the coward's way out, that's selfish, that's this, that's that, and they get really pissed off about it. And then there are other people who say, you know what, I hope they have finally found the peace that they're looking for now that they're not of this earth. What do you, what do you guys think about that? So here's my two cents. This is where the work that we do is so important. This is where education comes into play the trainings that we have to get people to understand what brings somebody to that point where they're planning to die by suicide. If people can recognize it and to show people where the resources are. We do not have a perfect system, and I will be the first person to tell you that. But just offering somebody a glimmer of hope 
one of the sessions that Anne Marie has is called Is This the Night? And what it does is it brings people together who may have had a friend, family member, who has maybe made attempt by suicide, who maybe have, have somebody currently in suicidal crisis. It brings them together so they can discuss you know, is this the night? Is this the night that I'm going to lose my loved one? So they can address their concerns, their fears, connect with other people who are going through a similar experience. Because again, no matter what it is, when you are identifying with people who are going through something like what you are, it gives you a connection. It gives you a little bit of peace of mind just to know that you're not alone. You gave the best answer, Derek. So research has shown millions of dollars poured into this research from attempt survivors, there's not one of them who said they wanted to die. They needed the internal psych ache to stop. They needed the internal pain, which none of us can touch if we haven't experienced it. But dying was not the ultimate end. It was to stop the pain. Tracy describes it as tunnel vision. So she has this litany of wonderful things around her. In that pain, she can't see it. She could never see it. She couldn't feel it. She couldn't touch it. All she knew is there was something eating inside of her that she had to stop. And so she saw that as the only option. Selfish? Absolutely not. And for anybody to say that, it shows a total lack of understanding, and that just perpetuates the prejudice and discrimination against someone who may have come to that brink. I I think some of your listeners may be surprised to know that 65 million people around the world have a fleeting thought of suicide, not unlike yours. May not even go so much as to take some action, but 65 million people around the world, according to the the World Health Organization, have had a thought of suicide. And I guarantee at any dinner table, if you asked anybody, no one would own up to it. No, and I was, you know, I was, I was going to agree with you that I think everybody thinks that there is relief out there. If I am so up to here with everything, I can get out of it. I can commit suicide, and I am done with it. And I think no one would own up to it, but I think everybody at one point in their life has thought about it. I mean, the day that this is being taped, I have just come from my therapy session today. And at the end of the session, any thoughts of hurting yourself? And I'm just like, you know, no. Any thoughts of hurting other people? Yes, every time I get into my car and start driving. and But they know that I'm only joking about yeah, that now, yeah. you know. So I think that's a great thing to, to realize because a lot of people would not own up to the fact that, hey, you know what? I've still thought about it after the attempt, mm-hmm. but it doesn't plague me. Right. I, I don't act on it. I'm just like, oh, you know what? It's just a, a fleeting thought, and it just it goes right by me because it's not an option for me. Because you have the coping skills now, and that's one of the most important things. That's where dialectical behavior therapy comes in. That's why talk therapy works, and and it may require medication too for some people. So we know there are solutions out there. The hard part is, as Jackie is saying, is to help people understand that there are resources that are there. So we have a grief support. We have the kitchen table conversation. We have two here in Attleboro. We have one in Taunton. We have another in Fall River. At best, you're going to see five people at the table. Now, take our numbers, 39 times 137, and if we're lucky, we have five people at each of our tables. We know there are thousands of people in Bristol County traumatized, post-traumatic stress because they lost someone to suicide, afraid to talk to other people about it because of that prejudice and discrimination. We need to bring this to the forefront. We need to make this a normalized conversation so we can take that prejudice and discrimination off of it. Every time I do a training, I said, now when you go home tonight, I want you to tell people what you just spent the last six hours doing. And they looked at me like, well, you're joking, right? And I went, no, I'm drop dead serious. I said, if we can't start the conversation about suicide and that there is help and there is hope, who else is going to do it for us? You know, yeah. so normalizing that conversation becomes important. Stats are one thing. I hate stats. These are people. Mm. These are souls we've lost because they were so despairing. What caused it is not nearly as relevant as how do we care for people before they get to that point, and how do we care for the people left behind? One thing that I have learned in our time doing this is the people that come there, it doesn't matter whether there are only three people there, minimum of a third of the people that are in our audience have experienced either lost somebody by suicide or has had somebody with a recent attempt 
that's that did survive and that they are there for a reason it's one person at a time yeah, yeah. If we are helping that one person then we are making a difference we're yeah. giving them some information that they can turn around you know my dad did business by word of mouth you know he was self-employed and he did his whole business by word of mouth for the most part and that's basically how we are doing this work right now is just grassroots with feet on the street all the way yeah because of the work we've done, we are we just kicked the doors open nationally. Um, the programs we've developed here in Bristol County, we are about to sign and um, collaborate with the American Association of Suicidology. That they're going to take the programs with a family and friends. The is this the night? We have a, a wellness check workshop for loss and attempt survivors who sit together at the table and learn from each other. And you know what the first thing they say to us is? I wish I had talked to one of you before. In other words, the attempt survivor said, I really wish I had listened to a loss survivor earlier. And loss survivors say, damn, why didn't someone tell me to come sit and listen to you? Because you may not have the answer as an attempt survivor, but when they hear your story and what brought you to that point, it lifts concrete blocks off their shoulder of irrational guilt, irrational blame. What did I miss? Was it my fault? Because most attempt survivors say it's no one's fault. There's no blame here. You know, that was something that was going on inside of me. Well, the work that we've been doing for the last 10 years is paying off nationally because now the American Association of Suicidology wants to negotiate how we can, they can take and use some of our work in a framework to then share it with the world. And in that, I see that as incredibly hopeful. I really do. I, it's like, wow, okay, yeah, all that hard work is paying off. It isn't about fame and fortune, and it's not, you know, funding, I almost hate to say this, but it's the truth. We don't need a whole hell of a lot of money. We need people. I'm not shoving anybody away who's got money, who wants to drop it on our, our doorstep, but we need an army. We need an army. Jackie and I were talking on the way down, and Jackie asked me, she said, are we doing something wrong? I said, we're not doing anything wrong. We don't have enough people to do the work we need to do. It's really that basic and simple. You know, a lot of people say um, I'm too open with people about my experiences. I mean, I came out on Facebook about five years ago about my mental illness, because how many times can my car break down with my anxiety and panic? How many times can I be sick? And it was like, that was the last monkey that was lifted off my shoulders. I know I can't be cured. I'm controlled now. I know I have things to offer people, because you feel so bad. And I think that was when I attempted the suicide. The one thing I wanted to ask you about kids in school, mm -hmm. Uh, a person commits suicide, you know, a student. Another one sees that, wow, my life is worse than that person's. I should probably do the same. Have you seen that, a domino effect where one person commits suicide and you see another person who says, oh, geez, my life is worse than that. I should, I should do it. So you're talking about contagion. No. In Bristol County, as close as we have come was nine years ago when we had five adolescents in New Bedford die, but even that was not called contagion, and here's why. They didn't know each other. They were from different backgrounds, different ethnic backgrounds, different families. The only thing they had in common was the school they went to. We have not, thankfully, seen any contagion in Bristol County, not since I've been in the field. And there was a problem down on um, Nantucket, but that's so hard to prove, Derek, because for that domino effect, that means you had to have those dominoes lined up. Now, what I will tell you is that we do know. Four years ago, uh, we lost a 14-year-old in, in Taunton. And within that next two weeks, we had several adolescents who either spoke up to say that they were feeling suicidal before anything was happened to them, or that they were depressed. I don't believe anybody actually made an attempt. But we had an extraordinary number of kids end up getting put into crisis and hospitalization. A part of that was because of the awareness that came out after that suicide about getting help and about talking to your kids. We waited about a month, and then I did a community presentation, and we had the house was pretty full. It was all parents. The mayor was there, a bunch of others, about how to talk to your kid when someone they know has died by suicide and how to properly address that. And, and it was amazing how many of them went home that night and had that conversation right away with their kids and found out their kids didn't know what to say or feel or could they talk, was it okay to talk about it? So contagion can be stopped with education and information. We're not seeing it. The only place I know that they're really looking at is out in Palo Alto 
there has been a really strong increase in high school suicides out there. Um, but they haven't, the verdict's not in yet. Is, is it contagion or is it that they just have kids that messed up? But it shouldn't take a contagion to have somebody in there. No, we bend over backwards to get into all of our school systems. Sometimes you have to almost do that a year in advance because of the way that schedule is within a school. And that's why we like to have the community conversation so people can come without that framework necessary. We've done a ton of work in schools in Bristol County to bring in. We've, we've trained teachers. We've trained students. Is there a lot more to be done? Absolutely. Many of our school districts here in the county have gone through what's called SOS, Signs of Suicide. It's a mental health screening that they can do within the schools. And a lot of them have implemented that, and they get pretty solid results. As many as 25, 30 kids a pop will say, I need to talk to someone right now. Again, the schools are overburdened and understaffed to be able to handle this. So this question goes out to both of you. What do you think is the biggest misconception when people talk about suicide? So in my experience in 21 years of being a nurse, I think what it is a lot of times, one, people are afraid. They don't know what to do. They don't know where to bring somebody. They don't know where to refer somebody. I've gotten calls from people. I've had to respond to situations in my, you know, in my job. And again, in the way the system is set up is not perfect, but it's what we have and we have to work within that current framework. Dovetailing on fear is a big factor here all around. A fear if I tell you that I'm feeling suicidal, fear if someone tells me they're suicidal and I'm not educated and informed about how to handle that. I think that's one of our biggest barriers. In one of our trainings, we call it the avoid, miss, and dismiss. I'll avoid the question because I don't want to hear the answer because I don't know what to do with you if you say yes. Missed it because I really didn't want to hear it in the first place or dismiss it as being, it can't be that, girls are moody anyway, right? Boys are just being boys. You know, they're out drinking. I think it's a generalized societal lack of compassion and understanding and information about what happens with a suicide. There's so much myth and misconception out there that um, I, I wish, I hope we both live long enough to be able to shatter it. But that's the biggest barrier is the myth and misconception, the societal judgment about anybody who isn't perfect. But I think that's really what it is. The research is coming out, and there are those in the field of the opiate addiction field who feel that it's possible that as many as 25% of all opiate deaths are an intentional suicide. I was a case manager for six years. I can tell you that any drug addict that sat in front of me who had overdosed was intentional. There was nothing accidental. However, we've got fentanyl in there in the middle of that. People within the suicide prevention community think that number is way higher. Um, it's not that I want them on our side of the street, but the problem is how sad is it that it's easier to acknowledge your child may have or a loved one may have died as an opiate addict than they were so mentally distressed that it was suicide. It shouldn't be that way. What should matter is how can we take care of you? How can we help? Let's get better resources. Let's get respites. But first of all, let's bring it to the table. I challenge everybody listening to this. If they listen to this podcast, tell people at lunch, at breakfast, at work, and at dinner, at the dinner table, guess what I heard? You should listen to this. That's the best weapon we've got. If you ask the question, are you thinking about suicide? And the answer is yes. People don't know what to do with that. Hopefully, the next question would be, ask them if they are already seeing a counselor or a case manager. Well, okay, let's sit down and maybe I'll help you make the call. If they don't have someone they're seeing, then you can volunteer to go and take them to the emergency department. If someone is in serious crisis, you have to drop the dime. We don't have an option. I wish we did. I wish we had respites where we could bring people and drop them off like a safe haven. Um, but we don't, they are in parts of the country, but we don't have them here. And it's important. What am I looking for? Extreme behavior modification changes, um, behaviors and appearance. Think of the extremes emotionally. Well, you know that yourself, Derek. You know, it's, they're not always going to be withdrawn and sucking their thumb. You know, they could be, look very functional. Indifference is a big thing to be careful about. And with kids, it's just a silence. If no, no other option is available, get them to an emergency room immediately, especially if there are weapons or there are means on board 
first of all, get the hell out of there and call the police because we're not set up to do that. But there's a whole list. That's what our basic Jackie is, a QPR training, question, persuade, refer. It's a lunch and learn. In 45 minutes, she can walk you through what to look for and then what to say and how to handle it. You're not going to make anybody kill themselves. Usually when you, they say yes and you don't run away, the important thing is to say, okay, it's all right to not be okay. Let's sit down and talk about it. This is important. You are important. There's an incredible relief that come from attempt survivors. We know that through research. They needed someone to ask. With all the celebrity deaths that we've had, it was wonderful to see the 1-800 number out there and reach out for help and that whole campaign. Typically, the people who cannot reach out for help are those who are in a suicidal crisis. If they could reach out for help, they might not die. So we need to stop waiting for the Mohammed to come to the mountain. We need to bring that out to everybody. We need to do a better job with, if you haven't seen someone for two weeks and we're bad at this, drop a dime, call them. Or oh, what is it, 50 cents now? No, there aren't even pay phones. Um, there are occasionally. Do, do, there, you know, there, there do, actually are. There was, there was. I know. No, we ran there was, into one. There was, and we took there pictures was, of it. Yeah, I, there was a thing on the news, not to get off track, but they, you know, they said there's still over two hundred thousand payphones that still bring in over a billion dollars a year. For the, I'm not. I'm for not the, surprised. Uh, yeah. Uh, I'm not surprised. But the the point is, is to you know just get people. We have to stop saying reach out for help. We know people. These are the very people who can't. So we need to do warm calls. When people are re- released from an emergency department for a suicidal crisis, where's the follow-up call to say 24 hours later, hey, just checking in, you okay? Or do you need to come back? We don't have that because that requires resources. That requires capital investment. I did a training over at the North Norton. Was it Norton? Norton. What a great group. I did senior citizens. What a riot they were. But, you know, I looked around the room and I said, so we got 40 people here maybe? Who's missing? You ask a bunch of seniors, they know who's missing, you know. So, you know, and they, they look to each other. I said, how long have you not seen that person? Oh, maybe a week and a half. I said, what are you waiting for? Well, I don't want to bother them. I don't want to be nosy. I said, you need to make a call. You need to be nosy. You need to be nosy. You need to make that call. So it's important. And, and again, one of the things that we talk about in our trainings is if you ask someone and they say, no, really, I'm fine, and their eyes are telling you they are in extreme pain, don't buy it. Say, you know what? I don't think so. Have a seat. We need to talk. But don't leave them alone. We can prevent suicide. And it's sometimes the simplest things. But what you just heard was, who's going to do all that work? We need an army. Can you find us an army? We need an army of people of all ages to talk to each other peer-to-peer because we can't change the system as it stands, Derek. Maybe the kids in first grade will be able to make that systemic change, but us sitting at this table, it's not going to happen in our lifetime. So rather than do workarounds, let's bring in something in the middle, and in the middle is peer-to-peer. And when I came out on Facebook, I got lots of private messages. You know, a lot of people liked it, and they were just like, oh, you know, but I was like, I wasn't looking for likes. Mm. I honestly felt that I was put on this earth to make my life an open book so I can help people. We have to make and a difference. And now yeah. people call me in the middle of the night having a panic attack, yep. and I calm them down, yep. and I have referred them to people, and, yep. and those people are getting help. And I said, all I ask of you is to pay it forward. Yep. Now people have signed up. You know, I had about 55, 60 people already sign up for the podcast. And they've gotten feedback, and they've been asking me questions privately. Like, if you want to be on the show, ask questions. I mean, that's that's a great thing. I just want to let the listeners know. I, I noticed your shirt when it came in. It says, "Is it purple?" I'm colorblind. Purple. Purple. So it says, "You okay?" It says, "Friends ask," and then it says, "Suicide prevention is everyone's business. I'm making it mine." And it's got phone numbers. So, it's, it's I wear a, this everywhere. It drives people crazy. <laughs> Well, and and that's the ignorance, isn't it? It is. Jackie will tell you, if I'm not wearing this, I'm wearing something that says suicide prevention is your business. And people will, like, look, you know, and and then all of a sudden they read it and they go, I've seen people almost walk into walls because they can read what's on the T-shirt. It's my savage amusement. Well, I mean, it's it's. (laughs) Like you said, it's grassroots, so you're your own walking billboard. Yeah, have to be. You have to be. Have to be. So um, before I let you ladies go, if you could give us some general information about where people could go around here as far as um, when it comes to suicide, suicide prevention, 
um, if there are any national numbers, because we are we are nationwide on this podcast. If you could give us some great information uh, or any information about where people can go locally and nationally, that would be great. What I would have people do is they can get in contact me for the Greater Attleboro Area Suicide Prevention Coalition. We have a Gmail account, which is G-A-A-S-P-C um, at gmail.com, or they could also call me in my office at City Hall, 508 508- Two two three two 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 extension three two four four. Um, that's probably the best way. And again, you know, I've already mentioned the kitchen table conversations that we have here, which are the suicide loss survivor support groups that we have. We have two a month, and again, I'll be happy to send people that information. We also have a Facebook page that we welcome people to go out in like um, that we're working hard on keeping updated we're looking at branching out into twitter maybe so one thing <gasps> at, one step at a time <laughs> i'm not techno girl i'm the social media chair for our state coalition so i've been pushing and pushing and pushing to get it out the national number the national suicide prevention lifeline is 1-800-273-8255 and the important thing about that number is that it, it isn't just for people who are suicidal If you're a loved one of someone that you're concerned about, you can call that number too. And if you dial that number and then hit one when the first recording comes on, that's all set up for veterans and their families. And that's another whole side of the national. I actually had some great conversations with the people on there. Yeah, uh, they're well trained. feeling lonely, not that I was going to commit suicide, but I just needed someone to talk to. My therapist wasn't available, and they're great people. And that's what they're trained to do. In Massachusetts, we have call to talk. And you don't even have to worry about what the number is because you can dial 211, which is a public health line, and say, I need to talk to someone about being depressed or suicidal, and they'll connect you with Call to Talk. They are part of the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. But as Jackie said, you know, we have resources all over the county. In Taunton, we have a kitchen table conversation for grief support. We have the Re-Energize and Reconnect Wellness Check for attempt and loss survivors together that we're now expanding not only across the county, but now it's going across the country. I'm leaving for Missouri on Monday, and we're delivering this training out there. And we also have Is This the Night, which is a really our big, big project, and that's for the family and friends like me who have been impacted by the suicidal crisis of a loved one. They can find that out. You can text me anytime. Don't call. I won't answer my phone. I'm usually on my phone. <laughs> 508-922-7278. Send me a text. It's Anne Marie. Let me know what it is you need, and I promise I will get right back to you. Uh, we have a, a website for Bristol County. It needs to be updated. It's www.bcrcsp.org. We also have a website, it's called avoiceatthetable.org, and that's the movement for the family, friends, and members. So we cover the whole bases, and just a last note is that we, in September, are launching a children's wellness book series for ages 0 to 7 that has dialectical behavior therapy in it, cognitive behavior therapy in it, and it reads like Dr. Seuss, and that's about as far upstream as we can go. And that's going to be when? September? We're leaving. We'll be kicking it off September 1st. Okay, because I'd like to have you back and, and, and we sure. can talk about that. We're um, excited about that project. That's yes, really absolutely. cool. you got to read these books. They're awesome. All those numbers that you gave, yeah. can people donate money or can they volunteer at those areas? Or are oh, there other places where they can? Yes, they can. Okay. <laughs> if they would like to support the Bristol County Regional Coalition, which then subsidizes the Greater Attleboro Area Coalition, our nonprofit is GTCS Inc., Greater Taunton Community Services Inc. We are a 501c3 nonprofit. The address is 111 High Street, Taunton, Mass. 02780. And if it's from the Greater Attleboro area, tell them to designate that because then that money will go into an account just for Jackie's work, so she can do the work out here. If it's in general, then that we just have a general category for volunteering. Either Jackie's email address or my text line. I tell you, we would love to have volunteers. We have two walks coming up. One's going to be here in Attleboro. Thank you. I was One's going to be next. over in Taunton on September 9th. We'd love to have them all come out. We have a motorcycle run on September 15th. So th- there's no lack of work. By the way, when we talk about volunteers, the worst thing you can do is have a whole bunch of volunteers come out and have them nothing for them to do. We have plenty of things for them to do. Trust me, we do. Any final thoughts from each one of you? Please stay. Don't give up. Yeah. Have hope. Have hope, as dark as it can be. 
you're not alone. And I mean that for those who, who are feeling suicidal and depressed, who have lost someone to suicide and think they're alone, and for the families who are worried that this is the night. Don't give up. Don't give up. Wait another day for the miracle. We have millions of attempt survivors who have proven that they can live full, happy lives. That's the best power example yeah. we have. I guess the other thing I wanted to mention too, Anne Marie, is you've done a great series of films. They're really important. I think that people should watch. You know, it, they can do it. They're what anywhere from what twenty five minutes to about two of them are twenty five minutes, and one is um, forty eight minutes. We call it the Voice of the Table series. A Voice of the Table is about four attempt survivors speaking out. That was a call to action from twenty fourteen. Voices still unheard is about uh, what happens to middle school kids and high school kids and college kids when they finally come forward and say that they're suicidal or depressed, how the schools responded or did not respond well with that, and what the reentry into schools was like and how that impacted the families. And our latest, Voices from the Shadows, is a story of five family connections uh, with a suicide attempt survivor and the family member of and how... That mostly works out okay, but not always works out okay. But they're all positive films. Um, and where can they view these? They're all on Vimeo. They can use my name, Anne Marie Matulis. We're moving them all over to another site, but they'll still be in both places. They're on Vimeo, and if they email Jackie or text me, I can send them the links. They're public. They're open to anybody who wants to watch them. I hope we can have you guys back when September 1st kicks off. With the, with the reading book. So I want to thank um, Anne-Marie and Jackie for coming in today. If um, anybody needs any help, Fuller Memorial Hospital, you can call 833-3-FULLER, which is 833-338-5537. Or you can contact Carrie Ballou, my co-host, and her number is 508-761-8500, and that's extension 2354 or you can reach out to her at Carrie, C-A-R-R-I-E dot Baloo, B-A-L-L-O-U, at U-H-S-I-N-C dot com. Fuller Hospital also has a um, You Are Not Alone drop-in. You can go to their Facebook page, which is You Are Not Alone, and that's at Attleboro Recovery also. If you have a problem or want to know more about the drop-in center, you can call the POP team at 508 222 1212 extension 1951. Also, if you've listened and you have any questions about the podcast, anything we've done in the past, and you have any questions that you want to email us in, you can email us at mentalillness at wararadio.com. This is heard on Monday nights on WARA Radio at 6 o'clock. And we are also uh, distributed through iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, and TuneIn. Um, once again, I want to thank Janky and Anne Marie. We definitely want to have you back in. I think it was just the tip of the iceberg, but you gave some really big information that I, I think is going to help a lot of our listeners out there. And just remember, you are not alone. It's not a tagline. It's not a gimmick. It's not a phrase. It's the truth. You are not alone. And if you know of anybody who doesn't look right, doesn't feel right, if you don't look right, you don't feel right, and something's wrong, Call 911 and get to an emergency room. They are not going to kick you out for wanting to be safe and saving yourself. So uh, once again, thank you to everybody for joining us. And uh, until next time, be well. The contents of the Exploring Mental Illness podcast provides general information and discussion about medicine, health, and related subjects. The content provided in this podcast, its associated website, and any links material are not intended and should not be construed as medical advice. This podcast should not be used in any legal capacity. No guarantee is given regarding the accuracy of any statements or opinions made on this podcast or its associated website. If the listener or any other person has a medical concern, they should consult an appropriately licensed healthcare professional. The views expressed on this podcast do not represent the views or opinions of Atterboro Access Cable Systems, Arbor Fuller Hospital, or their parents' corporations. The contents of the Exploring Mental Illness podcast and its associated website are copyrighted Attleboro Access Cable Systems. The podcast may be redistributed in accordance with Creative Commons License 4.0.